Hi folks, my name is Warbass. You're looking at the 4MS Wave Recorder. Is this, is this pronounced 4MS, 4Ms, 4 milliseconds? Do you say the whole thing? Somebody correct me. This module has become, over the past, I think, maybe two years that I've had it, probably one of the most important modules in my process, my productivity, and has completely changed the way I leverage my synthesizer and also the way I just produce music. I know I've talked about a lot in videos in the past uh, when I've done kind of patch from scratches and case walkthroughs, but I wanted today just to do a quick specific video on the module uh, ahead of the whole July of project where I'm going to be creating a, a lot of uh, just pure musical content. I thought, why not focus in on one module that sits at kind of the fulcrum of that process and makes it possible for me personally uh, to create that much content and record that much um, without having to worry about a whole lot. So I know there are a lot of approaches and, and ways to record any synthesizer, of course, uh, but especially in modular. I know a lot of people are fans of the um, ES9 from Expert Sleepers. A lot of people really love to multi-track uh, and bring things into Ableton or whatever to finish stuff up. I personally don't enjoy that. For a long time, when I had my modular gear, I would just kind of noodle with it and lived with this kind of um, mantra, vibe, of the music exists while I'm playing it, and once I'm done, it never does ever again. And um, that's great. It's totally valid experience if that's um, how you think and approach your process. I'm not saying that my way is right. I'm just saying it's the right way for me. Um, eventually I picked up this wave recorder. I can't remember where I read about it or how I found out about it, but it became this component that is almost just a requirement in any way. I think about so this is, I, I've almost bought a second one for the B case just because it on its own doesn't feel like a complete instrument to me until I have the ability to record built in because it's so ingrained in the way I think about this stuff. So what we're going to focus on today is just uh, this little tiny corner of the A case. I've got a patch that I'll play out at the end of this video. Uh, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on here and I still have a loop kind of recorded in the looper. And one thing I wanted to kind of start by showing you is just how dumb simple this is. So if we take our entire mix out from the Libre Legio. I've got a patch here that I was working on that I will um, play out at the end of this video. I'm just going to take the stereo outs of the Libre Legio, which again, the entire A case is, is going into right now. Plug those into the stereo ins on the wave recorder. Take the outs and put it into my output module. So I think this is crucial and totally by design to have outs on this. Now it can do this um, recording playback feature, which is one other way to leverage the outs. But to me, the outs are really important as it sits as a through component in my kind of signal flow. So I, I could in theory have the signal coming out of Libre Legio go to the wave recorder and go to my outs and that would still work just fine. But having it always patched through means that if I'm hearing audio, I am ready to record audio always in this case, um, which is totally a different mindset from what I would have to do to hook this up to my audio interface, turn on my computer, boot things up, uh, and like multi-track or even record a stereo track into a DAW. Now, I know that some people absolutely want that tight control in the DAW, and that's great. That, that's awesome. But for me, I want the immediacy of being able to t make a take um, when I feel like I'm producing something that I want to record without missing it, especially with how uh, kind of like, especially with how like nebulous the rest of modular is that, you know, there's no necessarily way to get back to a preset um, I know no matter how hard you try based on even the fine nature of knob positionings and whatnot, being able to just capture whatever I want when I want it and knowing that if I'm hearing something, I can record something has been kind of completely game changing for me over the past couple of years. All right. So let's, uh, enable recording here real quick. 
and then bring in some sound from the A case. Here we have a kind of weird loop. It's actually the B case being recorded uh, into the looper uh, with super, super short loop length and then changing the start position. You can see my volume is a little low. We're also super right heavy, but I can bring that up with the gain knob here. And we get clipping feedback. I probably just heard my voice change too because the gain knob here does apply to the out signal. So you can hear the increase in volume. Uh, it's not just a straight bypass through, it actually is that gain transfer to the outs. To stop a recording, we just hit the button again. Um, and, and that's it. I actually use this light here, turning red, to sync up the case's audio and the video uh, when I edit YouTube videos. It's literally because I don't do any post-processing of these files. I take them off the SD card, drag them to my desktop, then drag them right into Premiere, line them up based on the frame that that turns red, and then from there, trim and, and edit You know the ends of the clip. I almost never have to do any gain staging or gain just, I guess, adjustment in Premiere. Sometimes I will if it's too loud based on how loud my mic volume is or I need to adjust something for talking. But usually the volume and gain that I have coming out of here is pretty decent for what I need for, for a video. The other really, really nice thing that they did was made it so that the SD card can be hot swap. So as soon as this light's not busy, you can take the card out and grab that file which I'll, I'll show in a little bit how that works. Um, and you can even, without having to, you know, if your synth's already on, you can actually plug that back in and just hold the record button once. And as soon as it does that little kind of boot up sequence, now it's ready to, let's turn on some more sound, make another quick recording. You see the little red busy light is blinking, hopefully, to just tell you like, hey, don't yank the SD card out right now. All right, real quick, let's switch to uh, playback and click it again. Should turn green. And now we're hearing what I just recorded. There's a kind of file browser that um, you can use the knob for, I think. The manual goes away into detail of how they built the playback system. Um, I have almost never used the playback other than to verify that something did record. Uh, and that's kind of it. I've done it a couple times, but it it seems like a useful way to kind of check things and at least read things off the SD card. The other cool thing about this is the uh, recording uh, trigger in. So I'm going to grab the kind of total gate out of pressure points and just plug that in there. And now instead of having to click this button, I'm just going to tap another module, but I can enable uh, the recording of something. So let's bring some sound back in. stop that recording in the exact same way, which is kind of silly the way I just did it. But now if you had something very clocked, which the A case is not a very, you know, eight bar clocking case, B case kind of is, you can sync up the, you know, put a trigger at the start of your loop into that. And then you could get a nicely clocked tight um, loop recording. And if you have that continually going, turning that on and off, you could do a whole bunch of manipulations, a whole bunch of different kind of takes. You'd end up with a ton of really clean loops that you could use for, uh, post-processing and editing and whatnot later on. So let's, uh, take this SD card out now that we've got some files, uh, and go take a look at what it looks like on the computer. All right, over at the computer, we've got the SD card loaded in. I've renamed mine just to keep things a little organized. And what we've got here is a folder for every time the module has been booted and at least one recording has been made. Um, so then all of the recordings for that session go in the same folder. So here's one that just has a single one. There's one with a couple. If we come down to the very bottom, here are the recordings that we just, uh, just listened to in this video. Uh, 
uh, further back, we can grab um, older recordings. Let's just kind of take a random trip down memory lane. I don't know what that was. I think it was a little bit of FM radio sampling with the panharmonium. Same with this. I used to have a, a FM radio module in my A case version of the A case. I still have a module. And it would be my main thing I sampled. And I could only pick up one or two stations around here one that was in Spanish and one that was kind of a gospel Christian station. And both of them were perfect for super random sampling clips, especially pitched way down and through the panharmonium. Let's see what else is on here. This is more of that. I can hear the... I can hear the vocal chorus. I would pitch it down on the looper, throw it through the panharmonium and octave it back up. So you'd end up with this time stretched, re-synthesized. Some of these are on my channel, um, some of my earlier videos before I started doing these kind of like talking ones. Um, one thing to note is that the first folder will get really, really full because if you do that hot swapping thing I was talking about, those files actually end up in the first folder. So anytime, anytime you use the recording feature after hot swapping, it goes in the first folder. It doesn't make a new folder, which is really, really confusing the first time I did it and I thought I lost my recording. Uh, it just gets tucked in here so we can just... It's fairly recent, it's a B case something. Let's grab one more. Anyway, that's how it looks on the machine. Um, I will then literally drag these files right into the project folder and or literally right onto SoundCloud or wherever. Um, and for YouTube, I'll drag them right into Premiere uh, and then line them up like I showed earlier in the video uh, and then trim off the ends where I, I kind of want the actual take to be lined up. And that's literally it. So I've got so many of these 001-recording files scattered throughout my computer. W one thing I do want to kind of underline here at the end is that I don't necessarily think that this is the method for everybody. I don't think that you should um, throw away your DAW. Uh, I don't think that if you have an ES9 that that's wrong. Um, I just don't like multi-tracking. I don't like spending time editing. I don't love the producing um, in like the old you know engineering sense. Um, I don't even really like mixing after the fact. I just kind of like want to mix while I'm playing and that's it. And you can see that in my module selection, my cases, you know, things like the Jumble Hinge, the Libre Legio, Shack Mount High Pass, Golden Master, those modules are in there to try and make the product that comes out of the cases further along than it would be without them so that I can skip over any work that I have to do to the files on the computer. It's not perfect. Obviously, like a real mix engineer or master engineer would be able to do much better than those modules are uh, doing, but for me, it's plenty good enough and it enables me to work really, really fast so that I know that I can literally just have my cases, turn them on, and if I'm hearing music, I can hit record, always. And that personally is more valuable than the alternative. Uh, and it's really what made me go from never recording anything, even though I had an audio interface, had plenty of cables, could always have spun up a DAW and recorded into my computer. I would just almost never do that because I never thought my work was good enough to warrant it. And once the barrier of entry to, to make a recording was so low that it was just, I just had to do that and I could record, 
one, I, I took more recordings. I made, I did more takes, but I also put more effort into every patch and every time I was playing to try and make something worthy of a take because I knew it was right there. So, so much of my, of the early files on this would be a couple hours with the patch, find a couple sweet spots, get to know it, shut everything kind of back to an intro state, hit the record button, do one take and call it, and then uh, unpatch the whole thing and start again the next day. Um, that's what's worked really, really well for me. I don't necessarily think everyone needs to do that. I don't think that it's some you know secret that's gonna unlock your creativity or some YouTube nonsense that I think is way too prevalent on here. It's a tricky thing to do for me and I'm still still trying to figure it out. If I go too far into the pitchy space and like, this is the bit that's gonna unlock your thing, um, tell me. I'm gonna fade this out into a little set that I recorded with the 4MS Wave Recorder, like always. Um, and it's basically another little practice set heading into July. There's a couple of uh, bumps and bruises on this one. I knocked into the camera um, and it, it got a little weird in the middle, so I'm probably gonna cut it and not play the entire thing. I think it was about 45 minutes, but it's good enough to share right now. And uh, if you're still listening, I know this video probably got kind of long. Um, Thank you, and until next time, peace.